All right, beloved, welcome back to Global Spiritual Revolution Radio and Media Group out of New York City, New York. Call us in right now at 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, that is 929-477-3997. Now, if you live outside of the continental United States of America, call us in right now at 929-477-3997. Again, quickly, beloved, that is 929-477. Four seven seven three nine nine seven. We are nationally syndicated through the Talk America Radio Network out of Dallas, Texas. Now, um, the Talk America Radio Network is indeed um, the new dominant force in conservative talk radio, and we are also uh, ever so blessed to be a part of the world-renowned the iHeart Radio Network in the iHeart Media Group, also here in New York City, New York. Nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. I am so very excited. Uh, including my my uh, staff and production team here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, that by popular demand, uh, this great voice, this uh, great man of God, is indeed one of the most powerful and prolific uh, voices of truth and authenticity, not just in this country but around the world. And I just want to uh, welcome back uh, one of the most powerful clinical psychologist here in the Western Hemisphere and around the world, and that is the Honorable Dr. Umar Johnson. Uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much, man of God, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be back with us here tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Uh, Peace and black power. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be with the family. It is such a great honor, and again, we've been receiving thousands of emails actually for the past three months asking me, Bishop, when are we going to have Dr. Johnson back? And uh, the first time we had Dr. Johnson last summer, and we're going to continue this uh, very unique and fascinating topic uh, entitled The Psychosis of Identity and Economics. Again, The Psychosis of Identity and and economics. Um, from your perspective, um, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, is illegal immigration um, the new Jim Crow today? I mean, it seems like, uh, well, according to the um, uh, State Department in Washington, D.C., that it is costing the United States government uh, $135 billion a year of taking care of these Ill- Ill- illegal Immigrants. So, number one, how is illegal immigration, or from your perspective, um, uh, sir, is illegal immigration hurting black America? And number two, if it is hurting us, what is this diabolical diabolical plan? Why uh, has the powers that be, from your perspective, Dr. Johnson, chosen this route really to destabilize and to dismantle uh, black America? Excellent question. I have three key points on this topic. Point number one, black people need to be very careful in their support of the so-called illegal immigration population. And the reason they need to be careful is because immigrants have always been used against African-Americans from the time immediately following the Civil War until the recent Mexican explosion of the 21st century. These were not accidents. They were intentional strategies of the United States government to economically suffocate black people and ultimately render up a marginal and useless population within this country. When the Civil War ended in 1865, America had embarked upon its largest recruiting effort of immigrants up into that nation's history, up into that point in its history. They brought in 2 to 4 million Chinese, 2 to 4 million Irish, 2 to 4 million East Indians, 2 to 4 million Mexicans. Why would you bring in millions of minorities from other countries? cultural nationals, when you have two to four million freed ex-slaves who need work and have the skills to do that work. And the reason the government did that is they recognized that although slavery 
was built on the blacks of Africans, and it was extremely successful and beneficial and responsible for America being the global power it is today. But at the same time, they also understood that that was a very peculiar and sensitive relationship because white capital rested on black labor. During slavery, Hmm. the success of the white enterprise was 99% dependent on forced black labor. After the Civil War ended, the government decided it would never again give black people that much power over America's capitalistic regime. So bringing in these other people was done to limit our economic influence, limit our ability to fight for better wages, limit our ability to use our economics to organize our politics because money controls politics. Politics doesn't control money. So that's number one. And when these immigrants come into the United States, they come with the full knowledge that they are not to support, align themselves with, or collaborate, especially not identify with African Americans. If you study immigration from 1865 until now, you will see that the immigrant has always been a weapon used by white power against black people. So when I see black people rushing to march and struggle with these immigrants, it just shows how politically uneducated some of us are. These Arabs and East Indians and Chinese and Mexicans, they're not coming here to unite with you. They're not coming here to help you overthrow police genocide. They're coming here to take your job. They're coming here to take your house. They're coming here to take your place. Immigrants are not friends of black people. They never have been and they never will be because all groups are racist in their attitudes towards black people. They don't like us any better than the white man does. Point number two, I believe this whole immigration issue is smoke and mirrors. I believe it is a well-organized propaganda campaign by the government to distract the American people from the fact that they actually welcome immigrants, but they only welcome certain types of immigrants. What am I talking about? The Mexican explosion that took place at the beginning of the 21st century during the presidency of George W. Bush was by design. They brought the Mexicans in as a way to dissuade white corporations from relocating to second and third world nations. They let them in purposely so that they could be paid less than minimum wage so that they can be refused insurance, retirement packages, so forth and so on, because they were not citizens of America. In other words, the government had to come up with a strategy, keep businesses, homegrown American businesses in America. Because as you know, after Bill Clinton's NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that made it very easy for American corporations to go to second and third world countries in search of extremely cheap child labor. So after that uh, what do you, white flight of businesses out of the country, the government said we have to do something in order to keep our economy afloat. We've got to keep some of these large corporations here. So they are letting Mexicans in particular and some other groups in America deliberately so they can replace black people in the economic sector. That's exactly why they're here. Because they're not legal, they are the perfect source of cheap labor for white business. If you're not a United States citizen, I can pay you whatever I want. There's almost no laws to protect you because I'm doing you a favor. You're not going to complain about it. I don't have to worry about workman's comp. I don't have to worry about insurance. I don't have to worry about retirement. I don't have to worry about uh, FMLA. I don't have to worry about nothing. These immigrants are here because business has told the government, if you don't let them come across the border and work for us, I'm packing up my corporation and taking it elsewhere. And the third point is the Hmm. African immigration. I find it very interesting that in all this Hmm. immigration talk, CNN, C-SPAN, Newsline, Headline News, USA Today, New York Times, LA Times, I'm not seeing any 
specific dialogue on the role of the African immigrant in all of this. I'm seeing tan people. I'm seeing yellow people. I'm not seeing no black skin nappy headed people. And that is also by design. <laughs> Africans have been systematically excluded from taking advantage of America's immigration laws for at least 75 years. Our people have always had trouble coming to America. I have friends in Africa who've been seeking to get visas to visit me for only five or six days, and it's been over 10 years, and they still haven't been able to obtain access to America's borders. No one's talking about the African immigrants, particularly West and Central African immigrants, who can't even come for a visit, let alone relocate into the United mm-hmm. States. Most Africans who are here are here on work visa, student visa, okay, research and employment visas. That's it. America has a quota hmm. on how many black-skinned, nappy-headed folks from Africa they're going to let come <laughs> over here, and there's no conversation about that. The whole narrative is about brown people and yellow people, and I'm upset with our people because we're not even forcing the issue of African immigration on the table. We're fighting for non-African people when our own brothers and sisters are being hit the hardest by this immigration talk, and they have been suffering from it longer than all of the other groups on the tape. I don't understand, and again, um, we have with this world-renowned uh, clinical psychologist, the Honorable Dr. Yumar Johnson, uh, call us in right now to our live studios here in New York City, 929-477-3997. I do not understand why, for the life of me, Dr. Johnson, that the Congressional Black Caucus, led by uh, Congressman John Lewis, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Maxine Kerosene, Maxine Waters, uh, Sanford Bishop, all of these people, uh, James Kleinburn, that they would be so willing to fight to the death for illegal immigration and for DACA, but won't give that same energy to march and to fight uh, concerning black-on-black crime. Does that make any sense to you at all, uh, uh, Professor John? I, to- I totally agree. I totally agree with you. We as a people have so much on our table to deal with. I don't understand how any black leader, political, religious, or secular, can find time to lend an ear and a hand to the struggle of any other group particularly when you know that those groups are going to come here and participate. They're going to participate and support in the oppression of black people. Let's go to Michigan, where we have in Dearborn, one of the largest populations of ARAB immigrants living in America. Some have gotten their citizenship, others have not. And look at the racism and look at the violence and look at the murders of black people in the Michigan area just outside of Detroit by these ARAB immigrants. By no means am I saying that every ARAB immigrant in the Michigan area or in America is a murderer. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there is a clear pattern of racist abuse towards black people from other non-white people living in this country who we claim to be our allies whose immigration rights we fight for so they can only come into our community, rob us economically, come into our community, treat us less than human beings, come into our community, disrespect our elders and children, and in some cases even murder us. As far as the Congressional Black Caucus goes, I lost respect for them several years ago when they rewrote the mission of the CBC, and they rewrote it to state that the Congressional Black Caucus is no longer exclusively concerned about issues that affect black people. Their agenda is to fight for issues that affect all people. They thought they were doing something benevolent, but I would consider it an act of sabotage. Isn't it interesting? We're the only race in this country who feels uncomfortable and anxious about being 100% for itself. You don't see any Chinese groups saying they're fighting for everybody. They say they're fighting for Chinese. You don't see no Jewish groups 
saying they're fighting for everybody. They're fighting for Jews. You don't see Latino groups saying they're fighting for everybody. They're fighting for Latinos. And for the only special interest, political mainstream caucus that represents us or claims to on Capitol Hill, it is absolutely unacceptable for the CDC to be going after every minority <laughs> issue under the sun instead of focusing their attention on black people. And I would argue mm-hmm. this, one of the reasons that the CBC and all of our black Greek fraternities and sorority, all of them too, as well as the NAACP and the Urban League, and I have respect for all of these organizations, but they are all guilty of turning their back on black people by advocating a colorblind political platform. If you are going to be multicultural, if you are going to be colorblind, then don't claim to be black. Follow the Al <laughs> Sharpton line, where Reverend Sharpton had the Black Action Network, and then he changed it to the National mm-hmm. Action Network. And, of course, I didn't agree with that, but at least he was honest by taking the black out, making it clear that he's going to fight for whatever that can bring him some money. So so the Congressional Black Caucus needs to do the same thing. Don't call yourself yes. the Congressional Black Caucus. Don't call yourself a black Greek fraternity and sorority. Don't call yourself <laughs> National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, although that's a term that we got to look into a little deeper too because – one of the reasons they yeah. use colored and not black or Negro is because they wanted to make it clear that they were fighting for only a certain section of black folks when you study NAACP history. But any group <laughs> with the name black in it needs to be about black people exclusively, totally, and unapologetically. Otherwise, take the name black out of your name. And that is so interesting. And you hit a nerve with me, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson, when you said a few minutes ago about um, the the killing of our people from illegal immigrants, um, MS-13, <laughs> it's interesting. I, I know a week or two ago we did a segment about the history and the origins of, of MS-13. This, and again, I am not into our listeners all over the world, into our global spiritual revolution partners. I am not anti-Latino or Latina. I am not anti-Spanish. I am anti-crime and anti-foolishness. The MS-13, according to a uh, stat from the uh, Department of Justice in 2017, um, the highest rate of percentage of victims of MS-13 gangs is black people. And I guarantee you 90 to 95 percent of those um, animals in MS-13 are illegal immigrants. I'm not calling Spanish people uh, animals, okay? I am, I'm saying that as a conservative American, myself as a black conservative, MS-13 is one of the greatest threats to black America today. One of, am I correct on saying that? in saying that, Dr. Johnson, that MS-13, through illegal immigration, uh, is killing black people but also killing us economically as well. I would say this. Without specific knowledge on MS-13, what I can say to lead support to your point is that when we look at gang initiation activity in many Mm. cultural gangs, You have to take the life of someone who you do not know in order to prove your loyalty. You must either harm them in a serious way or take their life. And when we look at the population, largest hit as victims of gang initiation violence by non-white, non-black gangs in this country, cultural nationals, most of those victims are African, or should I say we are disproportionately represented amongst the victims of gang initiation requirements by non-white cultural immigrant gangs. We know that for a fact. But I would also go as far to say this. Don't give the gang too much credit. And I'm saying that because when I look (laughs) at California and what's happening in Los Angeles, and when I'm out in, in, in in the state of California, how many brothers and sisters I meet who have 
fatality stories that they share with me about relatives who were beaten or murdered by Latinos in general, Mexicans in particular, who may or may not have been members of gangs and who were not even brought to justice. I know one sister whose brother was murdered, a hit by a Mexican driver, and the man was never brought to justice by the police in the court system. So, yes, these gangs, I would argue, are at the forefront of the racial violence against black people. But I would say, generally speaking, the cultural attitude, and this is why black people do not need to be supporting immigration reform. These immigrants, when they come here, they are politicized to think exactly like white people. I want to say that again. When these brown and yellow people come to America after we so politically, foolishly fight for them to get in here, they then are politicized to think towards blacks and think of blacks in much the same way as white people do. In fact, even worse, maybe. Even worse, maybe. Why do I say that? Because a white person benefits from a white privilege. So they don't have to be as aggressive towards black people outside of what they would ordinarily be, given their culture of racism. But for a poor Arab or a poor Latino to come into this country, they will see black people as their competitors for bread and water. They will see us as their competitors for federal assistance. They will see us as their competitors for jobs and residence. So their racism towards blacks may even be more pronounced than the white man's because they don't benefit from the privilege that the white man has. That is so powerful. 929-477-3997. The Psychosis of Identity and Economics Part 2 here with world-renowned clinical psychologist, um, the Honorable Dr. Umar Johnson. Um, last year when you were on the air with us, um, Dr. Johnson, we talked about um, the athletic shoe in industrial complex, and, and Nike had put out a report last year that their financial projections for the year 2020 in two years would be $50 billion, and that will be more than the gross GDP of the nation of Costa Rica. Do you, again, just to reiterate what we talked about last summer, because what you talked about was so powerful and eye-opening, is Nike deliberately, not just Nike, you know, but the entire uh, athletic uh, shoe industrial complex here in America and around the world, is Nike deliberately in their corporate think tank meetings uh, targeting black youth, black America, but, but specifically people of color, and they're also targeting our, our psychology, our mindset of self-hate and low self-esteem. And am I correct in, in saying that uh, regarding uh, our psychology of self-hate and low self-esteem and why not just Nike, but really corporate America is targeting our low self-esteem? Without question. You are 100% correct. Nike is one of the corporations at the top of that list. Certain alcohol brands that sell the malt liquor and the beer are at the top of that list. Certain automobile manufacturers are at the top of that list. We know certain fast food companies like McDonald's are at the top of that list. They deliberately target the African-American dollar. And the reason why so many corporations and immigrant businesses, okay, target African Americans is because we're the only racial group in the country whose dollar has no loyalty attached to it. We are the only dollar that doesn't have a bias. The Chinese dollar is racist towards other people who are not Chinese. It's the Chinese dollar doesn't want to touch your hand if you're not Chinese. The Jewish dollar doesn't want to touch your hand if you're not a European Jew. The Latino dollar doesn't want to touch. The, the dollars, dollars have a consciousness of their own. Dollars have a because we put it in it by virtue of the way we spend it. I'm using it metaphorically. Black people's money doesn't have a loyalty. Black people's money 
in contrast to every other culture's money, doesn't like touching its own hand. So the black dollar wants to get out the black hand as quickly as it can. And every other culture's dollar wants to stay glued to the hand of its own people as long as it can. See, culture is a weapon. And every culture politicizes itself to negate outsiders who want to participate. One of the reasons no one can get into the Korean-dominated hair care industry is because the Koreans have weaponized culture as a defense for economic invasion or participation from any other group. That's why they don't sell in bulk to black people, because that hair care industry, although its number one customer is the black woman, in no way, shape, or form agreeable to any special treatment towards black people. And guess what? The sad thing is it doesn't have to. The Korean hair care industry doesn't have to improve its relationship to black beauticians, barbers, and cosmetologists because we are so addicted to the product that we will accept their disrespect just to purchase it. And so until we transform and politicize and weaponize black money. See, the issue is black money has not been weaponized to fight against racism and discrimination. Everyone else's money has been weaponized. Black people's money isn't weaponized. What do I mean when I say our money isn't weaponized? I'm saying when European Jews, Arabs, Chinese, East Indians, Latinos want to get something done in this country, they use their money to do it. When black people want to get something done in this country, we march and we vote. Let me say that again. When black people want to get something done in America, we march and we vote. When everyone else wants to get something done in America, they use their money. Look at the difference. Until we politicize Mm. and weaponize our money, we will never be free. It seems like that black America, uh, not every person in black America, but most, when examining the psychology um, and the perception of black America, we don't want power, Dr. Johnson. We want participation. Am I correct in saying that, sir? You are 100% correct. Here we go again. The same thing. Here we go again. Power (laughs) has been weaponized by every culture, every group in America is in pursuit of power, economic, political, social, intellectual, wealth-based power. Black people are the only group in this country who is absolutely uninterested in weaponizing their culture and identity to accumulate wealth and power, and we're going to stay at the bottom. It doesn't matter if our spending power goes up to $2 trillion. Our spending power can go up to $10 trillion. Our spending power can go up to a gazillion dollars. And guess what? We will still have no institutions in the black community because we are not interested in black power. We are interested in multicultural participation. We are interested in the pursuit of a reality that no Body else practices and, and when you have a group As despised as we are Seeking to Participate amongst those Who have rejected them For nearly a half Of a millennium We'll be celebrating 400 years Commemorating rather 400 years since the First of us were brought here For those of us who are descendants of Enslaved Africans and I happen To definitely be in that group, we'll be recognizing 400 years, summer of 19. So here we are, 400 years later, and we are still mm. begging to share, although we yes. have the ability to own and control. No black community in America can you show me that has the four major institutions necessary mm-hmm. to sustain community. No community, no black population in this country has those four institutions in the same space and time, and that is a supermarket, a bank, a hospital, and a school. I have yet to even black middle class 
neighborhoods are dependent on the white hospital. Even black upper class mm. neighborhoods are dependent on the white bank. Even black millionaires are running to the white supermarket. Mm. Even when we have funds in abundance, we still depend on the Europeans' infrastructure. Mm, mm, mm. And you know what, uh, Dr. Johnson? Again, this is so mind blowing tonight, and uh, I'm telling you, we got literally thousands and thousands of emails coming in, and millions of listeners. Uh, specifically, we now have a little over 27.3 million people online from more than 167 countries, and that is the most amount of people we've ever had at this point in the history uh, of our global work, 929-473-997. Um, the psychosis um, of identity and, and economics here, again, uh, with world-renowned clinical psychologist and one of America's uh, most powerful thinkers, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson. The black church, we talked about that, the faith-based faith initiative that uh, President um, George W. Bush initiated uh, since 1980, again, it gets back to what we talked about last time, uh, Dr. Johnson, the psychosis of not just black America, but the black church. Since 1980, black America, through the black church, has sustained and accumulated $420 billion in tithes and donations. Where has that money gone to? Four hundred, four hundred, four hundred and twenty, and twenty billion dollars. Go ahead, uh, Doc. This is in nineteen eighty. Now look yes, at sir. this: four hundred and twenty billion dollars in donations yes, to the church, and you can't yes. find a church that has those four <laughs> essential institutions. I mean, what is one of the biggest problems we have in our community? Wow. The miseducation of our children. Yes. Most. Teachers are middle class blacks, and of course, that whole middle class concept is something that got to be looked at. But they belong to these churches. Pastors have pulpits full of teachers, and yet they're not building schools. But here's the most egregious thing about that statistic it's not that the churches are taking in $420 billion or have taken it in since 1980, they have yes. not reciprocated to the community mm. the love that Come they on. get from the community. Where is the cyclical nature of give and take? If I understand religious mm. scripture well and being raised in the mosque and in the church, I understand it pretty well, I would say. Giving charity is about giving and receiving. So if charity yes. is about giving and receiving, why is it the church is always on the receiving end, but the church is rarely on the giving end? And I'm not talking about no Thanksgiving turkeys and no Christmas tree. <laughs> I'm talking about giving right. institutions, infrastructure, and places yes. much needed systems in our community. I'm going to say this, and some of the listeners may take offense. But I want them to look beyond their emotion. Look at yes. the black church functionally, not idealistically or theoretically. Don't look at the black church for what it's supposed to be. Don't look at the black church for what the Bible tells you it should be. Look at the black church for what it has been. Functionally speaking, can anyone give me a functional benefit to the black church? There is no mm. positive systematic function to the black church in black America for us. But there are three major functions for the black church for them, meaning the white power structure. Function number one, it distracts black people from the true struggles going on for our liberation, political, economic, and otherwise. Whereas we should be meeting to build schools and meeting to resist police genocide and meeting to overcome structural racism, bias, and inequalities instead of pursuing those agendas, 
We are in church all Sunday. We are in church for Bible study. We are in church for this. We are in church for that. Meaningful hours of our life that should be given to this liberation struggle are being used and wasted in church. Number two, church psychologically disarms black people away from who their true enemies are. The problem with black religion is not in the scripture. I don't have a problem with the Bible. I don't have a problem with the Quran. I don't have a problem with any of the beliefs of the church. I have a problem with the leadership. The leadership, not the dogma, not the doctrine, not the book, Mm -hmm. but the leadership of the church psychologically disarms black people and makes black people think that you can literally love your oppressor into submission. If anyone believes that to be true, show me a nation that was able to love its oppressor into submission. The church has manipulated black people's imagination so much that people now who are steeped in these churches can't tell the difference between reality and imagination because the pastor has manipulated both in his own effort and away from street organization and protest. And number three, which you just hit on, the black church has been a supreme success, a supreme success as it relates to preventing black money from being weaponized to serve black people. The black church has done an excellent job of preventing black people from weaponizing their money to improve their reality. Instead, you give it to Jesus by way of the pastor, but the money never ever gets to Jesus. But it does go to Bank of America. It does go to Chase Manhattan. It does go to Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. It does go to all of these white banks that participated in slavery, have not paid reparations, and will use black people's white Jesus money to finance gentrification. They will use black people's white Jesus money to fund racist political campaigns. They will use white black people's white Jesus money to help loan money to police districts and racist police who should be doing life in jail for killing unarmed blacks, but instead they're able to pay for the top lawyers in the country to keep them out of jail because the bank is ever willing to finance white power and systematic injustice, and they're using black people's money to do it. My question to any pastor is very simple. If you claim to be about God's will, why are you so comfortable with your congregation living in the devil's reality? And if you are so committed to God's purpose, then why do you take black people's money and give it to white banks so they can do the devil's work? And the thing is, again, we talked about this last summer, Dr. Johnson. Uh, uh, this is powerful, 929-477-3997, the psychosis of identity in economics part two, here with cl- uh, clinical psychologist Dr. Umar Johnson. And again, we talked about uh, these uh, multi-million dollar uh, slaves in the National Basketball Association, in the National Football League. Um, I believe there was a book put out a few years ago concerning million dollar slaves. And we talked about this last summer, Dr. Johnson, uh, that there is a great difference, a great distinction uh, between being rich versus being wealthy, okay? Somebody like Steph Curry is rich, but Steph Curry is not wealthy because Steph Curry doesn't sign any checks. He doesn't own the team. So it seems like we have to get, again, out of this mass psychosis um, of self-enslavement. And, and again, I'm going to say something. If I'm, if I'm wrong, just correct me, uh, Dr. Johnson, that you know, a wise man receives correction. M- m- when I look at white supremacy, okay, any, to me, to me, just me, as a, um, as a human being, um, to me, any type of supremacy is just as evil as white supremacy. So can, can you agree, uh, Dr. Johnson, as we're talking about the psychosis of identity and, and, and economics tonight, 
is black supremacy or Latino supremacy or Asian supremacy, is that just as evil as white supremacy? Uh, what say you about that, sir? I'm not sure if any other people on earth are capable of doing to human civilization what white people have done. Even if another group claimed to be supremacist, I do not think that they could match the length and the extent and the quality of evil that the European has reaped on the planet. With that being said, you're correct. We do not seek to replace white systematic injustice with a black systematic injustice. There are some Africans within the liberation struggle, and particularly my good brothers and sisters of the Bobo Shanti Rastafari Nation, who do use the banner of black supremacy. But to clarify, when they say black supremacy, they are not seeking to exercise dominion over any other race. When they speak of black supremacy, they speak of black people being supreme over themselves, black people Mm -hmm. having supreme decision-making power in all things related to black people. So from that perspective, I would have no issue with black supremacy. But from the perspective that you're introducing, I agree with you. I would disagree with someone who says we have to dominate the world the way the world has dominated us. That is not who we are as African people, and I think it is important that we understand we do not have to become like our oppressors to overcome our oppressors. And I have to say that again. We do not Mm -hmm. have to become like our oppressors in order to overcome our oppressors. And I say that because I am Mm -hmm. privy to certain conversations certain lines of thought, certain political and military rationales taking place currently within the black consciousness movement and the black liberation movement that suggest we have to entertain and employ some of the same diabolical, inhumane, uh, mischievous, mm-hmm. narcissistic <laughs> strategies that the European right. has used against us, and I will not. I will not be a party to that. I will not support that. My Lord, the supreme ruler of the universe, Black God of Africa, divine consciousness manifests. I believe in my heart and soul. Does not require come like the people. We need to get ourselves out from under in order to be victorious over us. Because if that is what's needed in order to win, then that automatically becomes a justification for any group to exercise supremacy over another. And I do not believe mm. that nature is designed that way. And, and again, we, we talked about this on uh, last summer, this uh, medical scientific um, terminology, uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, and to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, that term, neuroplasticity, simply means that the human brain becomes the shape of what that individual is thinking at that time. Now, again, this is my interpretation, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, and I'm so glad that we're talking about this tonight because a lot of people, their consciences are being opened right now uh, in Christ, 929-477-3997. Um, God is a spirit, you know, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I can say respectfully um, from one man of God to another, from just my perspective, um, the way I look at God, being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, whose name is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Christ. From my perspective, and what the Lord has revealed to me, that black America, the psychology of black America, we got young people, uh, we got black Americans 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years old, but emotionally they're still tied to the bottom of that slave ship. And when we look scripturally at the life of uh, Cain and Abel, okay, and it's very Um, mind-blowing, as we're talking about the psychosis, 
of identity and economics tonight, part two, is that the uh, Hasidic Hebrew word or interpretation for Cain is the word blood. And the Hasidic Hebrew interpretation for the word Abel is crit. And then we get the term bloods and crits. Now, to, again, from my perspective, and this is where we get the term, not just bloods and crits, Cain and Abel. And when we interconnect the words or names Cain to Abel, we get the word cannibal or the word cannibal. And so in black America, we are killing ourselves. Now, was slavery evil? Absolutely it was evil. There is no question, uh, what, 430 some years of slavery, look at the after effects of slavery. And I think what, um, not just the black church, the church as a whole, we have to get at the root of the problem. And, and, and again, I want to say this, Dr. Um, uh, Johnson, if I'm wrong, correct me. My interpretation uh, just as a man of God, as an individual, my interpretation of whether it's white supremacy or black supremacy or Latino supremacy, it is not a skin color or a pigmentation. It is a psychosis. It is a mindset that I am more superior than you because of the color of my skin. And, and so I just wanted to throw that out there and see what you thought. Again, this is just my interpretation. Doesn't mean that I'm right or you're wrong or you're wrong or I'm right. That um, the very root of what we call supremacy uh, is rooted in a people's past pain, uh, a, a people's past trauma. And so I, I don't think that the answer to me is marches and burning down your own communities um, because the root of this, we, again, we have a generation of black people who have a victim mentality. Um, and I, I can only speak for myself. No one owes me anything. Anything I've gotten is because of God and God alone. But uh, what say you, man of God? I, I believe what you're saying is so much truth as far as our history. Uh, no one has suffered more on this earth uh, besides us, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to say this. Uh, I probably will get in trouble. <laughs> uh, but um, and to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, if you get an opportunity, get the book um, entitled The Authentic History of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, from 1865 to 1877 by Dr. Susan Lawrence Davis, uh, who is a direct descendant of one of the founding members of the Alabama State KKK. She had made mention that the founding father, I want all of the listeners and all of the Global Spiritual Revolution radio uh, partners to hear this tonight, that the founding father of the KKK was Jewish, and I'm not anti-Semitic. I want to be, listen, I don't want to get no emails for the past week or two, for the next week or two, stating, Bishop, you are anti-Semitic. I am not. The founding father slash fathers of the KKK were not Nathan Bedford Forrest or Andrew Davis of the Confederacy. The founding father of the KKK was a man by the name of Benjamin Philip Judah who had created the KKK in 1866 in Pulaski, Tennessee, and financed the KKK with Rothschild money. I just wanted to throw that out there, and because it seems like, Dr. Johnson, uh, that we're all being played. Go right ahead. I, don't, I didn't mean to run my mouth or to have my own soapbox, but you really hit it in a lot of nerves with me tonight as we're talking about this psychosis. Let me say this because you're hitting on it right now, and it needs to be hit on. Yes, sir. I'm going to be teaching for the first time a course, and it will be the first annual course, of Pan-African Philosophy Leadership Training Colloquium. As you know, when Marcus Garvey was still amongst us, he used to make the leaders of the UNIA, the Garvey movement, go through a course that he taught himself. And so in keeping with his tradition, 
I'm going to start teaching an annual course. It will not be online. Brothers and sisters who want to participate must physically be there. And I want your listening audience to know now that mm-hmm. if they are interested in the course, they simply need to email me an autobiographical letter of interest. And all that means is they need to send me a one-page email telling me why they want to take this course and who they are, who they are, mm-hmm. and why do they want to take this course. And it's go- we're going to meet one Saturday every month for 12 months. Our first meeting will be in Philadelphia, Saturday, September the 8th, and it's always the same time, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 12 hours, once a month for 12 months, 144 class hours. I'm bringing that up because what you're hitting on right now, which is something we're going to talk about when we deal with the leadership aspect and the political science aspect of the black struggle in my course, is we have to deal with the reality that one of the ways white supremacy has been able to survive so long is it deliberately creates and finances its own opposition. I want to be clear on this point. Hmm. It creates and it finances its own opposition. What you just spoke of, the Ku Klux Klan actually having been founded by a European Jew, which the Klan claims to reject. Right. clearly shows that white supremacy is master manipulator at creating <laughs> its own opposition. Al-Qaeda, created by white yes. supremacy. The Taliban, created by white supremacy. Osama bin Laden, created <laughs> by white supremacy. NAACP, created by white supremacy. Urban League, created by white supremacy. And when mm. you control the enemy... When you create your own opposition, when you create your own opposition, you never have to be worried about ever being really challenged, and why not? The reason you never have to worry about really being challenged when you create your own opposition is because those who are opposed to you, those who are genuinely and sincerely opposed to your program, will flock Mm -hmm. the established opposition because they will consider them to be more powerful and more capable of taking you down. So Mm -hmm. you all, so for example, all Mm -hmm. of those people who were sincerely in support of whatever the al-Qaeda claimed to be against, they will flock to al-Qaeda because they got the resources, they got the manpower, they got the established name, they have the logistical layout. They have the platform, the program. Why create my own organization when there's always already another one, more financed, more known, larger, and more powerful out there? So the reason racism creates its own organizations is to control the opposition, and this is why I always tell mm-hmm. our people here, there, and everywhere around the world, mm-hmm. You have to investigate the black churches and black organizations that you plan on joining before you join them. I would argue, Mm. brother, that out of all the black churches we have and black community groups, integrationists and nationalists, integrationist groups and nationalists, I would argue that at least 50% of them are nothing but FBI and CIA fronts. We oh already goodness. know. We <laughs> already know that wow. much of the magazines and newspapers that are aimed <laughs> towards black people are controlled by the FBI and financed by the FBI. What did we recently find out about Gloria Steinem, the mother of the modern yes. feminist movement? She was That's an right. FBI agent. And the FBI was responsible for financing Gloria Steinem's Ms. magazine. I believe it was called Ms. Hmm. Her organ for promoting her feminist rhetoric. That whole magazine was financed by the FBI. So when we talk about waking up, we're not talking about just waking up to white supremacy. We're also talking Hmm. about waking up to its designs, its strategies, its tactics. Mm. I spoke 
in Montgomery, Alabama this past Sunday, two days ago, yes. for the very first time ever. Beautiful event. Loved it. Good energy. And I told those brothers and sisters in Montgomery Sunday afternoon that you all are living on sacred ground. And you're living on sacred ground because although Dr. King was not perfect, he was perfectly committed to the struggle. And Montgomery, Alabama is the site of the very last, the absolute last struggle by black people in a sustained, comprehensive, protracted way for black justice and equality. Not since the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott have you seen black people resist organized systemic institutional racism for 381 days as our brothers and sisters had resisted racism in the Montgomery bus company almost bankrupting the entire city because everyone depended on the bus in order to get to and from work. The children depended on the bus to get to and from school. So in boycotting the Montgomery Bus Corporation, they brought the economic apparatus of Montgomery, Alabama to its knees, to its mm. knees. That was the last time, the last time we did something that was that profound and that we had the unity and the stickability to stay with the agenda for 381 days. Look at what you get now, my brother. You get a one-day yes. march over here. You get a one-day boycott <laughs> over here. You get a one-day yes. protest over here. You get What can you do in one day? There is right. nothing under the sun you're going to accomplish in one day. But the reason right. black leadership keeps giving black people these so-called one-day revolutions is because they know that we are lazy. We are not as political as we used to be. Black people are more Eurocentric than ever before. We are addicted to social network and reality shows. And the truth of the matter, and no one wants to admit it, and this is why your radio platform is so powerful, most black yes. people would never admit this. They can't because they go to church. They can't admit it because it would be a sin against God. But the truth is most of our people are hmm. psychologically defeated. And if you are psychologically defeated, you are automatically sinning against the Lord because power rests with the most high. It does not rest with the white man. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? This is so powerful here. Uh, 929 seven seven three nine nine seven. Uh we have literally um thousands of emails coming in and also uh millions of people listening uh through the Talk America Radio Network. Uh nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. This is so powerful. When we look at uh, and I wanted to get your take on this because I don't believe we touched on the name of this individual when you were on the air last year, on um, George Soros. And to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, this George Soros, a Nazi, had said that I'm going to bring down the United States of America by funding black hate groups. Okay, again, this is George Soros, a Nazi. He said, I'm going to bring down the United States of America by funding black hate groups. And do you realize, uh, 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 Professor Johnson, you already know this, and, but to our global spiritual revolution partners who are listening all over the world, 80% of so-called black-owned hair care product companies, black-owned media companies are owned by this devil. George Soros, I kid you not, Black Hair Care Products, BET, Viacom, all of our so-called black little banks and schools are funded by this Nazi. And this Nazi, George Soros, is the biggest financial backer of Black Lives Matter. Um, and I'm going to say this, uh, Dr. Johnson, I thank God because you're so real, brother. And you and I, as men, we 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 just we're just real tonight, as always. All right, nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. Black Lives Matter. Listen, 
think Black Lives Matter are being used. And, 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 and you hit this right on the button a few minutes ago. And when you talk about white supremacy, um, evil, and, and when we talk about white supremacy to our listeners, we're not talking about white people. We're talking about the psychosis or the thinking of what we call white privilege or any type of privilege, whether it's black, brown, red, purple, or yellow. The privilege is not a pigmentation. It is a psychosis. It is a demon, because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, as the Word of God said. But George Soros, and, and again, Dr. John, I'm so happy that you brought up, again, that uh, a lot of these so-called black-run organizations, you, when you look at the history of the NAACP, it was, and again, I'm not an anti-Semitic, but it was founded by members of an Averitt, one of the most powerful Jewish organizations in the world, founded the NAACP, founded SNCC, founded CORE. Dr. Johnson, we don't own or run anything. And, and, Mal- and Malcolm X, one of the reasons why, and again, uh, I don't mean to go all over the map here. We're talking about the psychosis of identity and, and economics tonight. But Malcolm X in 1964, one year prior to his assassination, and he said, and I quote, that the nation of Islam was up until that point in 1964 subsidized and financed by a multi-billionaire, H.L. Hunt, out of Dallas, Texas. I'm not making this up to our global spiritual revolution partners. The video of Malcolm saying this is on YouTube. He said that H.L. Hunt, a white billionaire from Texas, who not only funded the KKK, but also funded the Nation of Islam. And so, in other words, when you, you hit a nerve with me, Dr. Johnson, a few minutes ago, and rightfully so, we're being played and fools. We're marching dying to the death for, for illegal immigrants, but you've got black-on-black crime. When Barack Obama was in office for eight years, he did not visit one black funeral in Chicago, Illinois, not one. He went up to Phoenix, Arizona, okay? He went over, he went to Connecticut, he went to Sandy Hook. But not one African American, and I'm saying this as a black conservative too, Dr. Johnson. I'm so glad, man. I love the way you teach, brother. Is it, I'm so upset with black folk that you voted for a man just because of, of the color of his skin. And I believe you said this last year, Dr. Uh, Johnson, that black people, we lost ground under Barack Obama. Am I correct in saying this, uh, Dr. Johnson? You are absolutely correct that we lost ground under Barack Obama. And not only did we lose ground, we made history, unfortunate history, but we made it nonetheless in three ways. President Barack Obama, the 44th (laughs) president of the United States of America, who happened to be a member of our race, was the first president in American history who was never directly and publicly challenged by African Americans Mm. to bring justice to their community. From George Washington all the way to George Bush, from George to George, we protested (laughs) under every president. It doesn't mean we got anything, but we made the world understand that we were not comfortable. Under Barack Obama, the first time in history, no black leader, no black organization, and black people collectively as a population never once publicly challenged the president to deliver justice to their front steps. Number two, we made history because under Barack Hussein Obama, black people have seen one of the worst episodes or eras of police genocide we have had since the civil rights movement. And again, we sat still with our hands folded and didn't make a demand of the president. And in fact, one of the biggest reasons we didn't get any redress from police genocide 
is because the white power structure knew that most of us were ambivalent and uncomfortable about criticizing a black president. So they understood that they would never have to bring justice to the police who killed Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and Walter Scott and Philando Cat Steele and Alton Sterling and Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice. They wouldn't have to bring justice to those on, yeah. because black people would only go as far as the governors of their state, the chief of police. They might even go to the U.S. Congress. They might even go to the Supreme Court, but they would never protest the president. In fact, if you remember, there was a march that the Congressional Black Caucus did. It was only for members of the caucus, black elected politicians, when they walked out Mm -hmm. of their office in unison and they marched to the Supreme Court and delivered them a demand for justice, and then they marched to the Congress and delivered the Congress a letter of demand for justice. This was maybe a year or two before Barack was out of office. This was, it was all over TV, CBC, standing up for justice. Well, here's my question. How can yes. the Congressional Black Caucus go to the Supreme Court and demand justice, go to Congress and demand justice, but you don't go to the president and demand justice? Last time hmm. I checked, the Supreme Court is the judicial branch of the government. It only interprets the law. That's it. Congress makes the law. But the president executes the law. And not only does the president execute the law, the president is the chief, the chief, the chief law enforcement Mm. officer of the United States government. And not a single politician, preacher, or black leader wanted to make it clear that whenever a police officer murders an unarmed black person, they do so with the full support of the chief law enforcement officer of this country, Barack Hussein Obama. So contrary to black people's emotions, Barack Obama's blood is on the bullets that killed Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin because he is ultimately responsible for any police activity or law enforcement activity in this country. So whenever that police officer pulls that pulls that trigger, Obama's spiritual hand is on that finger. Hmm. And, and can I ask you a question also, Professor Johnson? If the if a cop is uh, not just white, or if a cop is black and he shoots a person, whether they are black, brown, and white, uh, that is evil uh, just as well. Am, am I correct in saying that, Dr. Johnson? It's absolutely evil and unacceptable. But what do we know about that? We also know the consequences ah. are totally different. We already have right. going on right now, and I can't remember the cities. We have two black police who are guilty of killing one killed a white person or shot him. I don't know if they died. And the other, I believe, shot an immigrant. And if you look at the way that they handle black cops, they do not get the same protection as white police, even though they're also members of the FOP. In one case, the black cop was fired Mm. immediately. And in the other case, I believe he's being charged with a crime. Neither case did the white police rush to the defense of these black officers, which is why I say police genocide is not a police versus black people issue. It's a white supremacy versus black people issue because black Mm -hmm. people understand that they better never, ever take the life of a white person. It is one-sided. I just got a message from one of your listeners, and they wanted me to get out my email address. And so if anyone needs to reach me, they can email me at Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo.com. Yes. D R U M A R Johnson at Yahoo.com. Again, D R U M A R Johnson at Yahoo.com. Phone number 844 4 Dr. Umar. That's 844 4 D R U M A R. And let me also let them know. I will be speaking in Suffolk, Virginia, which is one of the seven cities right next to Norfolk on the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. Mm -hmm. I'll be in Suffolk this Sunday, July the 15th at 4 p.m. 
at Temple Beth El. Temple Beth El is one of our African Hebrew congregations, and they were gracious enough to allow Dr. Umar to return. My first visit in nearly three years. So if you live in Virginia, northern North Carolina, southern Maryland, or wherever you may live, southern North Carolina, excuse me, northern North Carolina, come on out Sunday, July the 15th, 4 o'clock, Temple Beth L in Suffolk, Virginia. All children are free. All elders are free. Discount for college students. I will also be in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, for the first time at a historically black college, Elizabeth City State University, August the 31st, and then I'll be in Raleigh, North Carolina, September 2nd, and then I'll be in Shreveport, Louisiana, for the first time, Mm. Friday, September the 14th, in Shreveport, and I'll be in Dallas, Texas, on Sunday, September the 16th, and then I'll go to Chicago, for the International African Arts Festival, and I'll be speaking at the Book Pavilion. Hopefully, my book will be ready for release, my second book, which is entitled Black Parent Advocate. Black Parent Mm. Advocate, the art of war, the art of war for fighting against America's racist public in charter schools. If anyone wants to pre-order the book, they can email me for the link or they can text message me for that link at 215-989-9858. Because I know you have international listeners, I want them to know that I'm scheduled to be in Ghana September 20th and 21st at a Pan-African conference. I'm also scheduled to be in the Gambia. I will be in the Gambia in November. I will be in Birmingham, England. October the 27th, in mm. London, England, November the 3rd, and I will be going to Haiti, the island of Haiti, for the first time in October. If anyone needs a list of the Beautiful. upcoming speaking engagements, they can email me, Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. They can also get their tickets at dreumarjohnson.eventb.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um, 929-473-997, and we got to get you here to New York City, uh, Dr. Johnson, and to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, uh, GSRR Media Group here in New York. We are uh, preparing a Global Black Conservative Summit there at the world-renowned Harvard University sometime in the spring of 2019, and I, I definitely want to invite Dr. Johnson to that, and people are saying, Wait a minute, uh, a bishop, you are a black conservative, and but I'm still black. <laughs> you know what Malcolm said? I don't care if you're conservative or liberal, if you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, at the end of the day, uh, you're still black. And, and so we are uh, planning a global black conservative summit, uh, God willing, in the spring of 2019 at Harvard University. Uh, at the Kennedy School of Government, and you'll be hearing about that in the many weeks and months to come. All right, 929-477-3997. And my, by the way, this George Soros, to you, Black Lives Matter, listen, and it's, and it's funny, Dr. Uh, Johnson, and I'm not downcasting Black Lives Matter. I don't mind you marching, yes, because uh, white cops killing black kids, it's murder. It's wrong. Absolutely, okay? But any time we bring up black-on-black crime, Black Lives Matter, they turn a deaf ear. Why? Because that changes the narrative. And this is what I said about Black Lives Matter. You're being used. You're being deceived and controlled by George Soros, okay? And I'm going to say, you may mention a Marcus Garvey again, Dr. Johnson. I am so happy that you brought him up. There is a woman... And we're talking about the psychosis of identity and economics tonight here uh, on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. There is a woman in history by the name of Margaret Sanger who founded Planned Parenthood in 1922. The first uh, abortion clinic in the United States was in Brownsville, New York. In 1916, that back then it was mostly blacks and a few Jews who lived there, but now it's mostly Jews. 
But the first abortion clinic in Harlem, New York, was it began by this demon, Margaret Sanger, okay, in 1929. Guess who helped her start the first abortion genocidal clinic in Harlem, New York, on the corner of 134th and Lenox Avenue? Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, and I'm going to say something, I'm going to get in trouble, Dr. Johnson, but listen, here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, it is our responsibility of not just to raise the consciousness of mankind to become the consciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also it is to awaken an unawakened generation in the 21st century. Margaret Sanger targeted Harlem, New York, targeted black America by going to Dr. Debbie E. Du Bois, and Dr. Du Bois was a contract agent. You talk about contract agents. Gloria Steinem. Margaret Sanger hired Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois was an agent provocateur for the United States government. Why? To suppress black thought in America. And I know this is sounds, it sounds strange, and you're shocked this is coming from a black conservative. Listen. So Margaret Sanger approach, and forgive me for running my mouth, Dr. Johnson, but you, you open up a, a, another nerve in me tonight. So uh, Dr. W.E.B. DeWoy's head told Margaret Sanger, if you want to take over black America, this is in 1929, you first have to target the black pulpit. I don't want everyone to hear me tonight because what you said earlier, man, I got about 45 minutes ago when we talked about the black church and the faith-based initiative. And you talk about white supremacy and all these supremacies, they target the leadership of the black community because the black community has been used as a political and social and spiritual petri dish for 430 years. So Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who was an agent provocateur working for J. Edgar Hoover, a homosexual of the FBI, to target Marcus Garvey. And so Marcus, and, and the question is why? And, and again, I'm going to say this, if I'm wrong, Dr. Johnson, correct me. Marcus Garvey was going to expose the black pastors of Harlem in 1929 and 1930 because the black pastors of Harlem, okay, beginning with Adam Clayton Powell Sr. of the Athenian Baptist Church, was paid $500 by Margaret Sanger to help establish the first black uh, abortion clinic in Harlem. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not talking about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. He doesn't take over the Abyssinia Baptist Church until 1937. I'm talking about Adam Clayton Powell Sr., his father, was approached by Margaret Sanger and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois in 1929 with $500. And Dr. Adam Clayton Powell Sr., who was the head of the Harlem Pastoral Alliance in 1929, and every black pastor, African-American pastor, our people, Dr. Johnson, in Harlem, received $500. For what? In other words, a black child, and I'm not making this a black and white issue, but a black child in the mind and in the psychology of Adam Clayton Powell Sr. and these black pastors was only worth $500. Yes, there's white supremacy, but there's also black self-hate supremacy. Why would we be suckered and bamboozled by Margaret Sanger? And mind you, Margaret Sanger at the time, Dr. Johnson, she was the mistress of Hollywood film director Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille was best friends, okay, with the Rockefeller family with John D. Rockefeller, who gave hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay, to Margaret Sanger 
to build the first black clinic in Harlem, New York. I know this has blown people's minds. This is the reason why Marcus Garvey was a threat, because Marcus Garvey was going to expose the black pastors of Harlem. What did you, Monica? I, I, I didn't mean to go all over the, the map there, but Margaret Sanger said about black people. She said black people are human waste and weeds that must be exterminated, 1922. Go ahead, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, absolutely correct. And one of the reasons the black church, I believe, bought into the Planned Parenthood movement was because of illegitimate so-called, because I don't consider any black child illegitimate, but because of illegitimate church, illegitimate births within the church. So, for example, you have a pastor cheating on his wife, the mistress gets pregnant, you have a teenage pregnancy here, a teenage pregnancy there. As you know, many black professional organizations, including churches, have always been narcissistically preoccupied with their public image. <laughs> I think yeah. many of them put that above the eugenic threat that Planned Parenthood really was and has been and still is, not even knowing they have fueled probably the greatest killing machine ever devised <laughs> against black people because no longer is it just Planned Parenthood. It's Planned Parenthood International. And this money wow. goes to branches of Planned Parenthood in Africa. I've seen Planned Parenthood trucks in Liberia. I've seen Planned Parenthood advertisements in Soweto, South Africa. Planned Parenthood uh -huh. is everywhere. And in Africa, yes. they are also part of the campaign to hyper-educate <laughs> black women as a strategy to reduce birth control. Now, why is this important? Many black women are being swept up into the feminist movement, this FBI-created and financed <laughs> feminist movement. Why do I say FBI-created, financed feminist movement? Not only on, yeah. because they built it and they financed it. Not only was feminist greatest modern champion Gloria Steinem an agent. Not only did they fund her and her propaganda <laughs> machine, but if you go back to the days of Marcus Garvey, one of the reasons that the woman got the right to vote and one of the reasons that the woman was finally given some degree of equality is because corporate America and the government apparatus mm -hmm. said in order for us to do two things, we're going to have to give women at least workplace and voter equality, even if not more mm -hmm. equality, workplace and voter equality. Number one, we are looking at a potentially untapped base of tax revenue. They put women to work so that they could tax their labor and so that the government could have an extra stream of income. It had nothing to do with women's rights. It had nothing to do with yeah. respecting females. It had nothing to do with female equality. It was about money. And the second reason that they started allowing women to go to college and work and that type of thing, vote, is because they said if we want to continue to control this country, we have to control the minds of the children. As long as the mothers are home, it will be difficult for us to control the children. We have to get the mothers out mm. of the house so that we can directly control the children. And this was right around the advent of the television, when the television just started going into households and the radio began to intensify its presence in households. They got the women out of the house so they could mm -hmm. control our children. And look, that's exactly what they're doing to black America today. They got the fathers in jail, the women at work, and the children are constantly being programmed 100% 24 hours a day. Feminism ain't got nothing to do with women's rights. Feminism is about government control over the minds of our children. Dr. Johnson, I am so happy that you brought up uh, concerning this American prison industrial complex. I'm going to get the stats here quickly, and I want you to take over from, from here, uh, Dr. Johnson, 929-477-3997. Again, 929-477-3997. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, 2017, 
the United States prison industrial complex made $33.5 billion. I want all the Global Spiritual Revolution partners to hear me. $33.5 billion, just one year, Dr. Johnson. And I'm not even talking about uh, the private prison contracting corporation. And mind you, I'm going to say something. Most of your congressional black caucus members, John Lewis, Eleanor Holmes, Kerosene Maxine Waters, they got stock in many of these prison contracting firms that contract out, Dr. Johnson, these prisons around the country and throughout the Caribbean. Maxine Waters is a multimillionaire. John Lewis is a multimillionaire. Now, I'm not downcasting John Lewis. Thank God for him and for the Pettus Bridge, crossing of you know, the Pettus Bridge. But at some point, Dr. Johnson, we as a people, we've got to not just get past the Pettus, um, the Pettus Bridge. We have to figure out how we can move on and stop, stop blaming white people. White people, yes, white supremacy, the psychosis but not white people in and of itself. Is there racism? Absolutely. But this prison uh, system, man of God, is so demonic in that 65 and to 70% uh, of the 2.1 million uh, persons in the American um, you know, penal system are black. Um, what say you about the, uh, when we're talking about the psychosis, uh, of uh, identity and economics and, and really concentrating on the American prison industrial complex? Well, I'm going to tell you, I had did <laughs> a Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram live seminar on yes, black mass incarceration. And some of the statistics that I found <laughs> even blew my mind. For example, wow. the state of Maryland has more black people in jail than white people. You actually have states. We know black people are disproportionately incarcerated. We know that there is disproportionality. But I'm saying even when you look at the raw numbers, when we are only 5%, 10%, 12% of a state, even when you look at the raw hmm. numbers with us being such small percentages, because we're not 50% of any state except Mississippi, if memory serves me correctly. So in all the other yes. states, black people, like I'm in Pennsylvania, 10%. You're normally looking at anywhere between a 5 and a 15 for most states in terms of our percentage. How can a group that is only 10% of your population be 50% of your prison. The only way you can explain that is two ways. You're either saying blacks commit more crime, which is the white supremacist narrative, and then there is the truthful, accurate narrative, and that is that crime is a function of race. You deliberately target crime that stereotypically are considered black, and you also investigate black people to see what type of crimes you can create because that's exactly what they did at the end of slavery. They said, okay, we don't need these black people competing with us for jobs. The number one reason for the mass incarceration of black people beginning in 1865 mm -hmm. Because up until 1865, white people were the majority in jail. We weren't in jail because we were needed to work. We were needed for labor. There were no black people in jail up until 1865. So then 1865, <laughs> no. the color begins to change. And why did the color change? Not just because they didn't want us in society, but also because they didn't want us to compete with them for employment, remember, black enslaved Africans had the skills mm. 
We were the brick masons. We were right. the ones making the shoes for the horses. We were the planters and the agriculturalists. Many of the crops that America uses came from Africa. They're not even native to America. So the white man was threatened by the free black man's ability to earn his work. And so prison became a way to eliminate competition. And that's exactly why. Once you get a felony on your record, they make it impossible you for you to gain work because the purpose of the felony is no different today than it was in 1865, and that is to render black men economically impotent so he will be useless to the society and useless to his own woman. And so they weaponized unemployment. <laughs> if you didn't have a job, you could go to jail. Have you ever heard of something so ridiculous in your life as going to jail because you didn't have employment? And we know because of the chain gangs, the corporations would come to the prisons and create contracted labor agreements where they would take black prisoners, and the corporations would work them, in many cases, to death. And guess what? That hasn't changed yet. You still have corporations making billions of dollars on the backs of black Jeez, prison man. laborers because when you are in prison, you are not a citizen. So you cannot get minimum wage. Prisoners get a dollar, dollar fifty, two dollars depending on your state. And the reason they can pay you less than minimum wage is because incarceration is a form of slavery, as the 13th Amendment clearly says. They did not end slavery. They transformed it. And when you look at death row, when you look Mm. at death row in America, death row is even worse than regular incarceration. More black people are on death row disproportionately than any other group, and in many states, all of the groups put together still don't reach the level of death row inmates that you see for black people. And when you look at plea bargains, 98, 95, 98% is in the 90s. At least 90% of all black criminal cases are plea bargained by a public pretender, excuse me, public defender. Mm, so you got black people in jail who did absolutely nothing wrong, they simply cannot afford decent legal representation. And let's not talk about getting bail. The United States Supreme Court ruled a couple of years ago that you do not have a right to bail. They say that the Constitution does not give you a right to bail. It gives you a right to a speedy trial. So if the judge denies you bail, you have no constitutional argument to make against that judge's decision because the Constitution doesn't give you bail. And not only that, when you look at the (laughs) bail that they give to black people compared to white people for the same crime, for the same crimes, the bails Mm -hmm. of black people are four and five times the amount the bails of white folks, even when black people financially and logistically are no threat risk whatsoever to standing trial because they don't have the money to get out of town or stay out of town. And then when we look at a speedy trial, are you kidding me? Do you know that there's black people who have been in jail three, four, five years waiting to be arraigned by the judge to even hear what their initial charges will be? And this is important for your listeners to understand because what they do now is in practice, they make you a prisoner. You're already convicted before you've even been charged or sentenced just by holding you so long before you go right. through your arraignment and then denying you bail before your trial end up as many brothers and sisters having already served five years for a crime you never even committed. The prison Clean ain't brother. nothing but a slave ship on water. Excuse me. Mm. The prison ain't nothing but a slave ship on land. Oh, wow. Kelly Browder was in jail here in New York almost three years. And they hounded him when he got out of jail where to the point he hung himself. Kelly Browder. 
you know, we're talking about, the, again, the psychosis of identity and uh, economics. Again, you hit another nerve with me, uh, Dr. Johnson, concerning uh, black labor. Now, during slavery, 95% of the engineers in the South were black men. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm not anti-Semitic and to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners. 99.9% .9 of Jewish people are beautiful people. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I'm talking about the 1% of devils, Zionists. I'm talking about Rothschilds. I'm talking about Warbirds, okay? Uh, I'm talking about Alzheimer's. There was a man by the name of Samuel Gompers, capital G-O-M-P-E-R-S. Uh, who created the American Federation of Labor, okay, uh, in the mid-1800s, which was a conspiracy, Dr. Johnson, to exclude black men, especially those that were free, that were engineers and tradesmen, those, that built, those who built the White House and those that built the Capitol. But you got this Samuel Gompers, who created the American Federation of Labor Union in the mid-1850s to exclude uh, black intelligentsia in the engineer, engineering industry. Now, uh, 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 again, I, I want to get back. Oh, my God. Um, you got to come back, Dr. Johnson. Uh, getting back to this devil, Margaret Singer. Margaret Singer, again, got her money. We just got an email from uh, a few emails concerning this person, Julius Rosenwald. Uh, now, Julius Rosenwald was the founder and creator of the Sears Roebuck Company, okay, in the 1800s. Julius Rosenwald got money, hundreds of thousands of, uh, hundreds of, thousands of dollars from John D. Rockefeller, and Julius Rosenwald gave that money to his best friend, Cecil B. DeMille, that Hollywood director of great hits yeah. like The Ten Commandments, who then gave that money to his mistress, Margaret Singer. Now, Margaret Singer's father, okay, and you will get this at the uh, New York University, NYU's history uh, department of the Margaret Singer papers of 1932, and in the June 1932 edition of the Birth Review, that the father uh, of Margaret Sanger had a liaison with a black female club dancer in Harlem, New York. Had a child, a daughter, with this club singer, okay? And then the child mysteriously dies uh, Dr. Johnson, at the age of 10, whereas the police, the NYU, the NYPD, found the child dead in the bedroom of the teenager, Margaret Singer. Now, y'all don't hear me tonight. Come on. Sir. And so I, I'm exposing this stuff tonight. Margaret Singer's uh, father had a liaison with an African-American club dancer, in Harlem, New York, in the early 1900s. And so, oh, now people may say, Bishop, okay, what's that got to do with the psychosis of identity in economics? It has everything to do with it. Because now we can see why the hatred of this woman, Margaret Singer, that she had toward non-white people. Margaret Singer had three sons, uh, Dr. Johnson, she didn't abort her son, but yet she was telling black families to abort their children, okay? So, and, and why would I bring up Julius Rosenwald? Julius Rosenwald built black colleges throughout the United States. That money to build Grambling, Alabama State, okay, Florida and I, Fisk University came from the money of this Jew, Julius Rosenwald, a Zionist. But the same Julius Rosenwald, Dr. Johnson, guess what else he funded? He gave $50,000 to the Tuskegee Institute for the syphilis conspiracy. Rosenwald did this. 
the same man that black people praise today as a civil rights and human rights leader. And the same Rosenwald who gave $50,000 to the Tuskegee Institute, which those black men, those families of those black men have never been compensated. Now, now some is just saying, well, Bishop, they received $30,000, $37,000 per family. Oh, wow. And you got President and don't Gerald forget. Clinton, another and devil. Don't forget. Go ahead, doctor. I didn't mean to cut don't your face. Don't forget. Oh, and I know you be wrong. Don't forget to leave out the fact. Don't forget oh. to leave out the fact that so many black women's white hero, Mrs. Hillary Clinton, oh, received thank you. the Margaret Singer Award, thank and you. she considers Margaret Singer oh. one of her greatest heroes, which right. does not come as a surprise because Hillary oh Clinton, God. when she was Secretary of State, considered population control the number one threat to American domestic and foreign interests. Not the Taliban, not Al-Qaeda, not Come on now. but population control, which is a cold Thank word you. for too many black children being born <laughs> into this world. Oh my God. I'm so, again, I'm so happy that you brought up uh, Hillary Rodden Clinton. Here is a woman who should be in prison right now, Dr. Johnson. Uh, not just not just the thirty-three thousand uh, classified emails that she, you know, had in her private server. Now she's saying, "Well, those were thirty-three thousand cook, cookbooks and menus." Bullcrap. But this woman called us super predators. And again, I don't understand. I don't want black people to, uh, Dr. Johnson, well, you got me right up to that. I don't understand why black pe- you black people, our people, when I say you black people, me too, you're my people. I don't care if you're conservative, liberal, whatnot, but as a conservative black man, I am so angry that our people are still supporting the Clintons, and specifically Hillary Rodden Clinton. She don't care about black people. She don't give a crap about black people. I'm talking about Hillary Clinton. Again, and I don't understand. And so, again, I'm so happy, again, that you brought up um, Hillary Clinton because she has millions of dollars. And I'm talking about millions of dollars in stock in many of these private contracting prison firms. And you know, one of the most vicious, and forgive me for running my mouth, Dr. Johnson, because you're, again, that's why you're a true teacher, brother, <laughs> because you open up the, the consciousness of God in me, okay? Uh, all of you uh, who are, are lovers of the states, I'm talking about the horse uh, race, do you realize that was founded and created and named after a slave owner? August Belmont, whose real name was August Scherenberg, a Zionist. And why would he call it the Belmont Stakes? He would always, and I want you all to hear me, August Scherenberg will always burn his slaves at the stake. That's why that race today is called the Belmont Stakes today. I know this is shocking you to our listeners. Well, Dr. Johnson knows this. I'm talking about to our listeners. I know this is shocking to you coming from a black Republican. Listen, I don't care if you're black. I don't care. If you're, listen, we are in trouble as a people, okay? And I applaud someone like LeBron James. They hate his guts. And the reason why they hate, I'm talking about the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He hates LeBron James's guts because LeBron James is not a slave. LeBron James said, listen, my destiny is in my own hands. And this is the reason why, like Spike Lee had said uh, back in 2010, that when LeBron James made that decision, forgive me for going all over the map here, but we're talking about the psychosis of identity and economics, including those in the NBA, is that the, um, the NBA owner, the sports and entertainment owners, the day is over with. This is what Spike said. The day is gone when the owner can dictate what the player should do. And it seems like, Dr. Johnson, there is an awakening 
of black men and women in the sports in the, uh, entertainment industry. A- am I correct in saying this, sir? Yes, sir. Wow. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, Doctor, uh, you, you got to come back, man. Um, we, we, you gotta, we're not going to let you go. <laughs> you got to come back. And uh, how can um, our listeners uh, support your all-black male school? Uh, tell us the name of it, and, and also give us links and information how uh, our listeners can support you in this regard, sir. Uh, certainly. The Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy can be supported by mail-in donations only by way of check or money order, which should be made payable to FDMG Academy, and that's the acronym for Frederick Douglass Marcus Harvey, FDMG Academy, and you should mail your check or money order to P.O. Box 6872. That's P.O. Box 6872. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19132. FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19132. If folks want to support my work outside of the school, they can make a donation either on the Cash app at cash.me slash dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson, D R U M A R Johnson or on PayPal at paypal.me slash Umar the Psychologist, the one word, U-M-A-R-T-H-E, Psychologist, all one word. They can email me, Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. Parents who need consultations with their children, special ed, ADHD, autism, learning disabilities, mental health, psychiatric meds, if you need a professional opinion, on what you should be doing with your black child with regard to mental health or education, you can schedule a consultation with me by telephone. And, again, you can email me for that, or you can text me, 215-989-9858. If you want to register for the first annual course of Pan-African Philosophy Leadership Training Colloquium one Saturday every month for 12 months, Email Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. And again, I will be in Suffolk, Virginia this Sunday, July the 15th, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, August the 31st, Raleigh, North Carolina, September 2nd, Shreveport, Louisiana, September the 14th, and Dallas, Texas, September the 16th. Tickets are at Dr. Umar Johnson. Event B, just like a bumblebee. D R U M A R Johnson dot E V E N T B E E event B dot com. And if you want to order, pre order the new book, Black Parent Advocate, you can email me or text me for the pre order book link. Mm. And to black men out there, I want to leave you this thought. And uh, uh, as jo- Dr. Johnson so powerfully articulated, Um, The Psychosis of Identity and Economics Part 2 here tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get paths on the back as you go, but your final reward would be heartache and tears if you cheated the man in the glass. I'm talking to black men, okay? Your final reward would be heartache and tears if you cheated the man in the glass. And tell them, black men, don't cheat yourself. Take responsibility for your life, okay? And I believe that many uh, of the prisons today, uh, many men can tell us, not all, but most of these men and women can tell us that there was no father in the home. That's where it starts, in the home. Yes, we are against the racist system, and I'm, you hit a nerve with me earlier, uh, Professor Johnson, when you talked about uh, black people can't get in jobs. You know, years ago, your father and my father can just go into a Ford automotive or a Chrysler automotive and get a job off the street for life. Now, they're, they're, they're telling, they're asking you for your credit. Wait a minute. To get a job, they are targeting black people 
and Latino people because they, they think that most black people and Latino people don't have any credit. So the, this is the system in the game um, that they are uh, perpetuating today. Um, Dr. Johnson, I'm telling any lasting words uh, before we sign off tonight. This was indeed, indeed one of the most powerful programs we've had. Uh, I just want to say thank you for having me back on. Definitely a program where we discuss things that I either have never talked about or haven't discussed in a while. This is a link that I definitely would like you to forward on to me once it's ready because I want to post it on my social yes, network so people can listen to it. A lot of good information, as you said, whether you want to agree with it or not, you need to hear yes. it. Um, and, again, thank you, and uh, I want to send a special uh, blessings out to the brothers and sisters in the whole New York yes. City and New York State area. I get a lot of Dr. Umar support. And I know you guys haven't seen me since last year, but I am working yes, on a lecture for this fall in New York and one of the boroughs, so I should have that information soon. Peace and black power. That is wow, that is so beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. And to our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, if you want to purchase Dr. Johnson's uh, powerful book, Psycho-Academic Holocaust, The Special Education in ADHD, Wars Against Black Boys, the Attention attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's really um, no father at home. That's what it is. And I love what you said last year. It's this glow-in-the-dark type of psychological term, again, that um, uh, that white supremacy has created. And again, title Academic Holocaust, the Special Education in ADHD, um, War Against Black Boys, definitely. And how can they purchase that book, Dr. John? If they want to get Psychoacademic Holocaust or pre-order the new book, they can text me, 215-989-9858. I'll send them the link, or they can email me, Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com, or attend any one of the upcoming lectures. Wow. And I believe Dr. Michelle Alexander had said uh, in a Huffington Post article that there are more black men in prison today than there were uh, in slavery in 1850. We have got to turn this around. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, uh, my friend, thank you so much again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be back with us here tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Please come back and be with us. Will do, my brother. God bless. God bless you. And to our Global Spiritual Revolution partner, that was Dr. Umar Johnson, uh, world-renowned clinical psychologist out of uh, the city of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Amen. And if you want to donate, listen, we here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, we need your finances. Okay, we are a global international movement. We're not just a, a, a Christian conservative uh, radio broadcasts, but we are a international apostolic movement that our job and responsibility as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ is to awaken an unawakened generation. I want every one of you, if you can, all right, give at least $25 right now. Go online to paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. Again, beloved, paypal.me, M-E, forward slash capital G, capital S, capital R, capital R Media Group. Now, GSRR Media Group has no dashes or spaces in between. Please go online right now to paypal.me, M-E, forward slash GSRR Media Group. Give $25 right now, $50. We need finances. No, it's not going in my back pocket to get a uh, Mercedes Benz or, or uh, <laughs> no, no, or to get a new home. No, this is for the furtherance of the gospel, for us to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the four corners of the earth, and so we can have um, the best of the best intellectuals, uh, historians, uh, not just those who are theologians in the body of Christ. But those who are historians, um, uh, academicians like uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson, we need your finances, beloved. Please go to paypal.me 
forward slash GSRR Media Group. Give right now, and I guarantee you, when you give unto the Lord, He will give you more to give. Good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For whatever you meet, I guarantee you, it shall be measured to you again. And to all of our black, white brothers and sisters, listen, we love you in Christ. And we were not talking about white people or black people or brown people. I want to make that perfectly clear. As we're talking about any type of supremacy, whether it's black, white, brown, yellow, red, it's evil, and it is corrupt at its very core. The only supremacy that we should be following and acknowledging is the total eternal supremacy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right? So I want you right now, go to paypal.me for slash GSRR Media Group. We need your finances. And we're going to be posting this powerful um, interview tonight on Facebook.com for slash um, Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, Twitter.com for slash Bishop L. Gators. And we're also going to be asking you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube.com for slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio or just type in Global Spiritual Revolution Radio on YouTube and subscribe to us and get the very best content that you will ever hear on radio today. We love you guys in Jesus' name and we will be back um, uh, next Tuesday. Uh, praise God. And we are going to move the Acts of the Apostle Summit from Thursday to Tuesdays. And so the brothers will be back on Tuesday as we continue to talk about issues affecting the body of Christ today. All right, we'll see you next time here from New York City, uh, for we are raising the consciousness of mankind to become the consciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Bishop Larry Gators, host and moderator of Global Spiritual Revolution Radio and Media Group. Also check us out on TalkAmericaRadio.com. I'm sorry, TalkAmericaRadio.us, TalkAmericaRadio.us, forward slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Hey, praise God. And if you want to email me with any questions, send your emails right now at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. But we together are raising the consciousness of mankind to become the consciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great weekend, everyone. We will see you next time here and only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Good night. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes.
Thank you. 